month as your president. And I'm very happy to be here. I have a few slides that I'm going to share with you. And then Jenny, our, uh, is that mistress of ceremony that we call it, is going to take over. Thanks again. I'm going to start sharing the slides. Okay, if you can see this, I'm moving my winter. Um, again, thank you. And we'll start. And we'll start by just reminding we have done been doing a lot of Zoom meetings, but just in case, if you'd please mute your microphone when you're not talking. If you'd like, please have your camera on. It's wonderful to see everyone. But again, if you're not comfortable, that's okay. Please feel free to rename yourself so that you include your pronouns and anything that we might have missed. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and then someone is going to be watching that so that we make sure that we answer your questions. Again, welcome. Let's get started. As I told, our presenter is going to be Jenny Klusnik. She is a member of the Leadership Committee, and she is going to be presenting the awards. And I'm going to do the few uh, slides to start with, and then we, we're getting the show on the road. Welcome. At each meeting at the association, we start with our ancestral lands acknowledgement. And we ask that you take a moment to honor and acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. Indigenous people have a long standing history and connection to the land since time immemorial and are the original stewards of lands and waters. Many American Indians were forcibly exiled from their lands because of aggressive and persistent settled colonialism and U.S. governmental policies, but they persevere. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota and Anishinaabe people, ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. Our equity committee, Health Equity Committee, created this acknowledgement. And if you go to our website, there is additional information there. This is our agenda for today. We have the Governing Council Board, financial summary and organizational highlights to start with. And uh, the Governing Council has been a wonderful body to help me as I am, as I acted as the president. Thank you, Ellen, for your support, your skills and your volunteerism, your hours that you put in. Thank you, Dr. Caleb Schultz, member at large for your volunteer work, uh, Kristen Ackert, and Austin Wu, who was the co-chair of our Health Equity Committee uh, for a few years. Uh, you missed, and we are very grateful for all your contributions. And we welcome our new governing council members, Tyler Pyle who uh, has worked with us in our annual meeting, is now the president-elect. And I'm very proud of uh, Tyler, and I welcome him. Then we have a member at large, Susie Keith, and another member at large, Nancy Frank Wilson. Welcome. This is our uh, governing council for this year. Kristen Moore is our new president, and president-elect is Tyler Pyle. I have one year left, folks. I am the immediate past president and uh, group liaison. Uh, Teresa Holtz is our secretary. Sherry Lee Sherry is our treasurer. She is wonderful at counting our beans. Our affiliate representative at the American Public Health Association is Annie Allen. 
two member at large in Greater Minnesota, Yvette Ellis and Kanye Norman. Thank you. And we have four members at large, Susie Keith, Tolu, Jaquisa, Tolu Oyelo, Jaquisa Thompson, and Nancy Frank Wilson. And we have two student representatives, Roshan Katri and Tatiana Lopez. Thanks again for your services. Um, not done yet, folks. We, we are a small but mighty organization, lots and lots of volunteers. As you can see here, we have several committees and the chairs are listed here. Conference Planning Committee, Development Task Force, Health Equity History, Leadership Development, and the list goes on. We are very happy to continue to have the leadership of Mary Grande. She is an executive director and much, much more, and we are grateful for her. Leica has joined her as an operations specialist. We have an intern, Diane. Chris Epperson, Esperson was a racial, racial health equity coordinator. And Nick Allen, our rural health equity coordinator. Thanks again. Uh, Sherry Lee? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Antonia. Um, so this is just a real brief um, financial summary of where we are at today. And then we were taking a look at um, just the past year from June 1st, 2023 to May 31st, 2024. So as you can see, we've got a little over 10,000 in our checking account. We have um, a, a, almost 146,000 in our savings. Um, which brings us to a total of $156,372.57. Um, financials are always available upon request. So if you're interested in more detail, just send um, an email to treasurer at mpha.net um, to request, and then we can provide that for you. Um, we had a transition this past year um, going from um, one um, accounting firm to another, um, and we did have a very good transition to an accountant um, within the Clifton Allen Larson um, organization, um, so that's going very well. Um, we still have more things we're working on and tweaking, but we're in a much better place than we were a year ago, um, just knowing where we're at. So when we take a look at um, over the past year, um, our total revenues were 107,000, a little over 107,000. Our total expenses were hundred, almost 140,000, which gives us a negative um, rev net revenue of 60,000. Now our financials are based on cash as opposed to doing an accrual. So we're missing a little bit um, on uh, uh, just on grant receipts. Um, and so we didn't have that in there. We just pulled what we had from the previous year. Um, but in the future, we'll be able to show it a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more accurate because um, on our accounts receivable, we'll, we'll have our, our information in um, uh, on a faster, basis. Um, let's see here. Um, the contact information for treasure. And I also want to put a plug in. So um, when when the board or the governing council took a look at where we were at with our budget this this past, um, you know, where we're at, at, at for this year um, with our budget, our budget is a calendar year starting January to December. Um, we were just a little bit negative, around right around six thousand um, uh, under budget. But again, we were waiting for um, a grant um, uh, reimbursement to come in, so we're just about even. Um, so, or maybe even a little bit in the plus. So, I don't want us to worry and say, "Oh my goodness, we're not." managing our finances well, et cetera. Um, we do have a, a handle on it, um, but we have had a number of grants this past year. 
and uh, the grants don't last forever. And so, um, so as we continue to look to do more fundraising, um, looking at how we can increase uh, revenue, um, we just want to make sure that um, you all are aware of that. That's where we're always looking. We we, we accept donations, um, and um, if you're not a member, we encourage you to become a member. Um, so, the, and if you know of folks that um, may be interested in in um, becoming a member of MPHA, then feel free to um, uh, uh, send them the information, and um, they're able to talk to Mary or other folks. So I think I'll just leave it at that. And um, again, if you have any questions, you can send them to uh, this email address as well. Thank you very much, Cheryl Lee, uh, our treasurer. If you don't mind, I need to go back to one slide because when I was telling you about our committees, I failed to mention a brand new one that we are going to start creating first as a task force to see the progress and go through the protocols that we go through here at the association. It's the Planetary Health Task Force. It's brand new and we welcome members. We welcome you to consider joining it and participating in the discussions of the task force. And so we give birth to our committees. Thank you. Is any Helen with us? Uh, Annie is an affiliate uh, representative to the governing council uh, of the American Public Health Association. So she represents Minnesota on the Great Lakes Public Health Coalition in the region, Region 5, which is where we are located. And as you can see, the states surrounding us and a few other states are members of this coalition. She also is the leader of our host affiliate committee for the conference that the American Public Health Association is holding here in Minneapolis. So um, we're really looking forward to it. Here are the dates. It's going to be at the convention center, October 27 through uh, October 30th. And um, the whole nation is going to come here. It's over 10,000 people, folks. I have been very fortunate to attend two of them, one in Boston and one in Atlanta. And they are amazing, a lot of good learning. The early bird registration closes July 15th. And um, if you're a member, watch for the deals letter so that we can um, offer you opportunities to get involved. If you'd like to contact any, go to argc at mpha.net. Thank you. Um, the highlights for the annual conference. Do we have Kristen with us or Tyler? I don't want to steal that thunder. Tyler, would you like to share? Or would you like me to? Um, if you wanted to start, I could always fill in. Sounds good. <laughs> um, so we hosted the 2024 MPHA Annual Conference in April um, at St. Kate's University in St. Paul. We also had a virtual option. Uh, we had 314 um, individuals who registered. Most of those people, about 225 people each day, attended in person, which was great. Um, we had five keynotes and plenaries, 15 concurrent sessions, and 38 posters. Um, Tyler, would you like to go through the next pieces and thank the committee? <laughs> yeah, so, um, oh goodness. Okay, so we had a, a great number of sponsors um, and this this planning committee, um, I really, I really could not say enough about the people who sit on this committee and who volunteer their time every single year, or even volunteer bits of advice here and there. Um, I know, especially as we come down to the wire, we touch base um, with people from different committees, including equity, 
we touch base with um with people from MDH just to make sure that there's more that we can do or any kind of funding um, that we could receive. Um, but it it's always just fantastic. And I, I just can't say enough about the people who sit on this committee, the work that they do and all the last minute tweaks. I know Mary and Krista and I uh, both talked about how every year it seems there's things right at the end um, that come up like, oh, you know, we forgot this and small things. Um, but we're always so lucky for how people volunteer themselves. Thank you, both Tyler and Kristen. It was a wonderful conference. Um, are any of the members of the Health Equity Committee, or should I just uh, mention? No, I'm, I'm here to represent. Yes, Sarah, please. Yeah. Thank you. Sarah Rogers, new co-chair of the Health Equity Committee, along with Madison Anderson, who I see her name on the call, on this call. She's welcome to come off mute if she wants to. And Erica Fishman, who led the, there she is. There's, there's my counterpart. She's fantastic. We just met, you know, a few months ago, and now it's just like we're BFFs. It's going to be so much fun. Anyways, um... Really excited to continue the great leadership of this um, of this committee, um, and thank you so much to Austin for his leadership. Going to have some big shoes to fill. Eric, I see that you're on camera, um, so feel free to come off mute if, if you want, um, and you can go over what you would like to share, or you know, happy to as well. I could just add on what um, is on the slide that we had a lot of speakers come last year and a lot of really important topics. We had an important session on the racial equity impact notes and racial equity impact assessments, um, which was really exciting and encouraging. We also had a session on disaggregated data and what it means, and that was in collaboration with Hmong Public Health Association. And we had, an we had a session on um, looking at the environment with the Women's Environment Initiative. Um, we also supported the work of the Rural Health and Racial Equity Project, and we've been a part of the Voting and in Health Initiative. Um, re recently, this month, we had the 10th anniversary of the Advancing Health Equity Report, and there's a link on the MPHA website, or you can email um, our committee, if you're interested in looking at the session, if you couldn't attend in person. And then finally, our committee meets on the third Thursdays from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. virtually, except for a few months that we take off and we don't have our meetings. Anything else, Sarah? No, that's wonderful. Thank you. And if you want to connect with the Health Equity Committee, uh, the email address is there, healthequitysmpha.net. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, our history um, committee is co-chaired by De Donna Anderson and Kathleen Norlean. I don't know if either one of them is here with us, but these are some of the activities that they have produced. Is someone um, to talk I'm about here. this? I'm oh, great. And maybe Kathy mm -hmm. is too, but I'll start. Donna, you can go ahead. Okay. Well, ah, I'm delighted. Uh, first of all, I'm just delighted that Kathy and Norlene agreed to be a co chair with me. This is going to be a wonderful partnership, um, and I'm thrilled. Um, our primary, well, we've, we had a couple of meetings. You froze there, Donna. I don't know if you can hear us. It is to explore some things that we, um, Linnea Anderson at the Social Welfare Archives Library and Mark Ingerbritson from the Communications Department at the library did the bulk of the work on the script and also the video recording and produced this three minute video that introduces people to the archives shown at the um, MPHA annual meeting at St. Kate's. And it was also submitted to um, APHA as a possible uh, candidate for their film festival 
along with another archives that we had at the suggestion of Linnea that features um, Dr. Ed Ellinger and Dr. Michael Osterholm from 1984. And we're waiting to hear if we've been accepted. Um, so we're still getting additional materials in from the archives, both from individuals and organizations like the Minnesota Lung Association and working on the transfer of our electronic records to incorporate those into the archives. So um, we've had a number of people who've expressed interest in serving on this committee, uh, although we're a little bit ad hoc and we'll be reaching out to you. And if you don't hear from us, contact either Kathy or, or me. Kathy, would you like to add anything? Just that I'm very excited to be working with Donna and we'll be meeting a little bit more once uh, things calm down a little bit. And I just love the video and hope everyone's seen it and glad that we have it for the annual, the larger annual APHA meeting. So be great. thank you. Thank you, both Kathy and Donna. And if you need to connect with them, there is an email address there at the bottom of the slide. Um, one of our committees is also the leadership committee and they are the committee um, who are responsible for today's uh, event. So Anne Zukowski and Shirley, Sherry, would you like to say a few words? Uh, sure. Um, uh, Anne got pulled into a meeting, um, so she's coming on a little bit late. Um, but Ann and I have been co-chairing the uh, leadership committee, and uh, we wanted to welcome Jenny Kuznick, um, who is, uh, she just jumped right in to, uh, to, to participate. And, um, and so uh, we just wanted to do like a formal welcome and a thank you to, to Jenny. Basically, our, our committee responsibilities include um, the election. So it's kind of like the nomination committee um, for uh, elections for the governing council. We do board orientation, and then we coordinate the MPHA awards, doing the call for nominations, and then um, doing the, the selection from um, the wonderful nominations that we get. We also try to um, work hard on identifying new leaders that um, uh, to strengthen our association. And that's a, a year round process. So when you hear me talk about encouraging people to join MPHA, that's just not treasure looking at treasure, but that's also <laughs> from that viewpoint, it's also um, really looking at um, bringing in uh, new leadership um, for the organization. So, so please reach out support. at any time. <laughs> Thank You're you. You're a great supporter, Sherry Lee. Thank you. If you'd like to connect with Sherry Lee or Anne, here is the email address leadership at mpha.net. Membership and communications. Ellen Tolu, are you with us? Yeah, I think Tolu just hopped on. Do you want to start off, Tolu, or do you want me to? Please go ahead and I can chime in. Okay. <laughs> so first off, I have to say how appreciative I am of Tulu being a co-chair with me. Um, you know, she's really brought so much like reflection and strategy. And like, sometimes I kind of, I'm wondering, she's like, what do we need to get done right now? Like I really appreciate <laughs> Um, having you as a co-chair a lot. Um, and also, we just really appreciate our committee members. And we really especially want to shout out Jakisa and Natasha, um, who joined, I think, probably, what, like January or February, and have just kind of taken the lead on, you know, events and work and, you know, thinking about our LAPS membership process. Um, it's wonderful. And our meetings are very fun, everybody. So, I have to put in a plug for our committee. Uh, we did our membership survey, which we do every two years, um, and some kind of strategic planning as a committee related to that. Some of the things that we heard from that um, is that people really value 
networking, the range of programming that we do, professional development. Do you want to, <laughs> I feel like I'm going a lot to loop. Do you want to go or do you want me to keep No, going? please go ahead. Go ahead. You're doing great. <laughs> um, for a variety of reasons, like feedback from members, thinking about, um, you know, growth for MPHA. We are considering a modest dues increase um, that will happen, you know, in several months, streamlining our membership categories to make it easier for people, um, you know, and really maintaining our commitment to having scholarships available for membership, um, encouraging people when they, you know, renew or join as members to donate to support access to membership for other folks. Uh, we are working on kind of tying in value of membership with increasing uh, members only events and partnerships. And through our like committees, discussions, strategic planning, informed by, you know, the governing council and what we hear from people at events in our annual conference. Um, our focus in this next year is really on engaging in, you know, understanding rural public health and working with folks in greater Minnesota in a wide range of public health professions, and then also building our relationships and programming and partnerships with students. We meet monthly, the second Monday, it is virtual. We have lots of ideas in need of people to pick them up <laughs> and make them their own. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen and Tolu. And as she's saying, join us, you'll like us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the policy forums, I think I saw I'm some here. of the members. Kathy Lynn is here and yeah, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, Lindsay Fabian here. I'm representing the Policy Forum Committee. Angie Carlson is our chair, and other members are Leah Berg and Kathy Norlean, who's uh, on the meeting today. Just wanted to mm -hmm. highlight what our committee did this last year. We hosted a series of four forums on our theme, Mythbusters, What's Tried and True and What's New, and focused each forum on a different age group that you can see on the screen here. A shout out to the past presidents who were moderators, Ellen, Dave Golden, Paul Terry, and Ken Bentz. And our forums are found on the YouTube channel if you are not able to attend in person. And more info to come soon about the series that will start in the fall. Hope to see you at one of our events. Thanks, Antonia. Back to you. Thank you, Lindsay. I have appreciated coming to those uh, morning meetings as I was the the president. I will continue to come. <laughs> so Please thank do. you. Yeah, of course. Um, policy and advocacy. Are Matt or Natalie here? That's also an important committee for us because it supports advocacy on policies and topics to reduce structural racism, including public health authority and workforce, public health funding, voting access, immunizations, affordable housing, mental health, gun violence prevention, which is nice because a certain general just declared it a public health crisis and community health workers. Um, and they have also implemented an advocacy software tool every action. So we are now connected as other affiliates are with software. They meet monthly, the first Wednesday or the lunch hour. And if you go to the website for the Minnesota Public Health Association, you'll see new times. If you need to connect with them, here is the email address, policyandmpha.net. Um, planetary health. I don't know, Tyler, if you'd like to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I met, um, I don't know if Melissa is here today. Actually, no, okay. So I met um, Melissa Thone at our annual conference this year. Um, and we were talking about how planetary health is a major part of not just public health, um, but just every oh you are here oh wonderful okay well melissa if you want to jump in at any point please feel free 
Um, but we're talking about how planetary health is important to our everyday activities and everything that we do impacts planetary health. Um, and we are talking about opportunities for Melissa to be involved with MPHA. Um, and that got us to talking about planetary health, which Melissa has actually done a lot of work in. Um, and Melissa, I think I'd like for you to talk a little bit more potentially about what you see for the potential in this. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Thon. I recently graduated with my doctorate in nursing in health innovation and leadership. And my doctoral work focused around planetary health and the relationship between climate change and human health. So basically my, my belief in Tyler and I found a lot of common ground here that the health of our planet affects our health and we as human beings are also in turn responsible for the health of our planet. And there is, so there's a lot of overlap with public health and planetary health and climate change. And um, for me personally, I think that social determinants of health and climate change are intrinsically linked and climate change exacerbates um, those social determinants of health. So I would love to see MPHA start to look at some of these factors and how they affect each other and um, looking at it through this lens of planetary health um, because it's transdisciplinary. So it incorporates all fields, including, including public health. And I love that it's optimistic and it's solution a solutions oriented way of looking at climate change. So I'm really excited that there are other folks with MPHA who are excited about this as well. Thank you. And congratulations, Dr. Thon. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. And uh, Dr. Thon. <laughs> still, I hope I'm pronouncing getting, your last name you correctly. You are, you are. And I'm still, I'm still getting used to that. And I'm also getting <laughs> used to this idea of free time again. Um, which right. my, my partner was like, yeah, that's not going to last long. You're going to, you're going to fill your time very quickly. And he is right because here I am. <laughs> we welcome. We hope not to tire you too much. <laughs> no, I'm very excited. Great. Thank you. Tyler, did you have your hand up? Yeah. I, I just wanted to reaffirm something that <clears throat> Melissa had mentioned, um, this is something that I, I'm really hoping we can bring in people from all across MPHA. Um, you know, with planetary health, we're not, we're not just looking for people with um, epidemiological and infectious disease experience or environmental scientists or climate change scientists. We're also very interested in the anti-racist work and the policy work um, really anything, even if your background is in civil or public engineering or um, political science and you understand how zoning works to discriminate against or uplift communities in um, our regional or national elections, we do really want everyone to take an interest in this because like Melissa said, everyone contributes to it and planetary health impacts everybody. Um, so I think of planetary health and one of the things um, as, as a gardener myself that I've always wanted to talk to people about, and I do talk to people about, are the ways in which you can change green spaces, but that's just one aspect of it. A whole other aspect of planetary health are the policies that we interact with or that are enacted upon us or around us every single day. So just some food for thought. It is a welcome task force um, with the hopes of a committee for anyone, whatever your background is. Right. You heard the man, folks. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I think I, we are almost finished. Let me get my... Um, the Racial Health Equity Project. Uh, Mary, is Nick with us? I don't believe so, Antonia, but um, the next couple of slides, um, uh, they're just kind of some brief updates on two projects that we had or recently had uh, funding for. 
Um, and so and I'm we'll, sorry, I misspoke. It's Chris, not Nick. It, it, it covers both of these. Um, so yeah, we will send the slides out to folks as well. So you can read these brief updates that we're showing at our meeting. Um, in Thank you. Recording. Yeah. Um, is Nick here? No. I will uh, skip to the next slide because I have stayed too long. So I'm past my time. And um, I just would like to make sure that we are thankful to all the supporters who have partnered with the Minnesota Public Health Association. And as you can see, there is a long list. We hope to make new partners and we are very grateful for those who have supported us along the line. So thank you for providing us financial support, in-kind, programmatic support, and just being our friends. Thanks, everyone. And this is it for me. So, Jenny, uh, this is your time now. Would you like me to move these slides for you? Yes, please. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. I'd be happy to. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. And we're so excited for this next portion of our session today. Uh, I'm super excited to be have the opportunity to um, describe the awards and get to share and learn from all our awardees. I'm the newest member, as I was highlighted, of the Leadership Committee. And I hear and can see that this is often the, one of the most favorite events um, of MPHA and of the Governing Council and Leadership Committee where we get to uh, hear about the work efforts and inspiration from our colleagues in the field. Um, each year, the Leadership Committee, um, which is co-chaired by Anne and Cheryl Lee, uh, send out a call to membership to nominate leaders in our field to be recognized. And this year we had a significant number of nominations and each year these nominations are reviewed and a slate is presented to the MPHA Governing Council for approval. This year we're so excited and pleased to be able to present seven awards today. And I think one of the unique and when I was learning and uh, getting oriented to my role today, but also with the Leadership Council was the unique opportunity that we asked those who actually nominated our awardees and recipients a recipient, recipients of the award to make the presentation and share a bit of their of their uh, submission for the recipients. Um, what I will do um, as far as logistics is I will always ask for help if I'm if for example I mispronounce a name or I get something out of order. Please interrupt and let me know. I look forward to meeting all of you at one point as I get more more grounded in this position. But please, if at anything, something goes awry, please let me know. Um, but what we will do is I will, um, uh, what I will do is I will read the description of the award and then I will hand that off to the person who was the nominator for the award. And we'll ask you to say a few words about, um, about the recipient of the award. And then the awardee, we ask that if you have your award that you also hold that up and we'd love to give a screenshot and really take that moment to, um, to recognize your contributions and also a screenshot of the award in that time. Um, so uh, as a reminder, we continue to ask you to mute your lines and then unmute as if you're one of the nominator or awardees. Get a Kleenex if you're in that touchy moment to hear some inspiration and we can get started. All right, so you're Thank ready for you. the next slide? Next slide, please. Okay. So oh. the, first, <laughs> the first award um, the, is the Albert Justice Chelsea Award. And this honors an individual who has distinguished themselves in the field of public health and who have, uh, through their membership, had a definite contribution to the Minnesota Public Health Association. And the nominator for this award was Tulu. And I wanted to hand that off to um, you to say a few words. Thank you, Jenny. Is my mic? Yes, my mic is on. 
I guess I'm going to ask you if you would just spend a few minutes thinking that just in the last 20 minutes that we've been together today, how many times have you seen the name Ellen on the screen, right? And I <laughs> yeah. think that that to me is one of the reasons why her name just jumped up for me as I read the Abba Justice uh, Chelsea Award criteria. I think uh, the, the words that come to my mind when I think of Ellen are passionate, organized, efficient, always joyful. And I think that when you're living out your passion, sometimes it doesn't feel like work because you're feeding your soul. But the truth of the matter is that Ellen is involved in so many things in her volunteer life, in her public life, in her professional life, in her personal life. In her professional life, she is involved in maternal and child health, reproductive health. In her personal life, when she's not thinking about community gardens, she's thinking about getting out votes to uh, voter registration. Um, and then, as you know, she's been the past president of the MPHA and currently chairs the membership and uh, communication. She's, uh, we would chair it together. And that is where I've just come to know her on a very personal level. And truly, she is authentically everything public health. She lives it, she breathes it, um, and she does it with joy. And so I was given three minutes to speak. I'm going to be quiet. Congratulations, Ellen. Thank you. You were just oh, you were just killing me to thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm very okay. Uh, yeah. Um there are very few things other than like my family that I have been involved with as long as I'm PJ. And this um this really means a lot to me. If you could not tell, um, I think there's a few things I wrote down, so I hopefully wouldn't cry, but then Tulu, thank you. That was very thoughtful. Um, there's a few things I feel like I've really gained through the many different things I've done with MPJ. You know, thankfully I'm not managing social media anymore. Um, you know, planning conferences, learning how to use the wild apricot website platform you know like being the president um and i think i've really gained so much confidence i mean you look at the list of who's been president who's had this award and you're like oh god there's no way that's me but at some point you know they were a 25 year old health educator i think which is when i started um on the governing council with MPHA, right? Um, and everyone is so supportive and encouraging and like, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff, but like I also have dropped the ball on a lot of stuff too. <laughs> um, and everyone has been very like gracious about that. And I think that's one of the really big things about MPHA. Um, I think also there's just been a tremendous widening of my understanding of public health and my feelings of like belonging in this community. I think one of the things that I love most about public health is everyone has different skills, different interests, and everybody is so passionate and brings so much to it. That's the thing I love most about MPHA and the work that I've done with MPHA is trying to think about how to connect people and foster belonging, have fun and have it so people can have experiences like I've had right where you know you can connect with someone who's working over in cancer right you can you know learn from people working in housing access it just improves um you know it's improved in my work um and I think we're all all of our connections help us um do our work and our communities and yeah I do want to say you can see maybe in the chat, Claire Fleming, she was the person who talked me into running for the governing council. I think she was maybe talked into it by Erica Fishman. Um, and thank you. Um, yeah, that's all I will say. Thank you. And thank you for your patience <laughs> with my uh, emotions. It means a lot to me. 
Thank you so much, Ellen. Congratulations. All right, for our next award is the uh, B. Robert Lewis Award and is presented to an elected, elected official who has distinguished themselves in aggressive pursuit to establish and maintain health as a human right and to secure optimal community and personal health. And for this award, I would like to, um, was a group of nominators, but Jaime Martinez, I believe is on, um, on the session today to make the award. Jaime, are you there? We had checked before and I believe. And we did we did think we saw his iPhone because um, I guess his internet had gone out. And Eric, I was just wondering, um, do you know if he's able to come on? He thought he was gonna be able to, but let me text him and see what's going on. His phone on. is on mute, just in I, case he's trying to get on. And yeah, can you, I can you unmute him from our end, Mary? Uh, I am trying. Um, I all I can do is ask him to unmute. So Jaime, um, if you're trying to figure out the unmute, I'll I'll text you. <laughs> Just a second. Looks like unmuted. Yep, it's unmuted. Jaime, are you there? I'm here. Oh, oh yeah. good. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I've had the worst day with my internet today, and now my phone's acting up. Um, oh, no. But you can hear me now. Yes, we can. You all can hear me now? Okay, great. Yes. So uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to introduce this um, candidate. Um, there were a handful of us that uh, felt like Representative uh, Kozlowski, and I asked for forgiveness if I mispronounced the name. Um, so I, we wrote up the, the nomination for representative, representative Kozlowski, who has uh, been a, a representing their hometown of Duluth as a state legislator uh, over the last, since 2000, I believe, 22. Um, uh, they are, they identify as a nine binary, a two spirit, and they are Anishinaabe. Uh, Ojibwe and Mexican or uh, Mexican origin. The the reason um, that I felt like they deserved nomination is because they sort of represent my vision of what happens to some of us in our communities who experience a variety of uh, challenges and disadvantages uh, are marginalized, and then we sort of move forward and step up, and then um, the community has sort of encouraged us to. To run for office or to run for positions that are, um, make a difference in terms of making policy decisions or decisions that that provide a positive direction for our communities and the state. Um, Representative Kozlowski, uh, Kozlowski considers themselves a reluctant politician. Um, they didn't start out to to do this kind of work and work in the political arena, but through the work that um, they had done in the community to improve health. They saw a lot of disparities um, and having experienced the same, what was inspired to, to do more than uh, even get themselves in, in good health. Uh, the community asked them to step up to run for office. Um, they accepted the challenge and have done amazing work uh, in the last, uh, since they've been in, office, which has been a short period, period so far, and we look forward to seeing more great things happen. Uh, so the Representative Kozlowski, Kozlowski uh, serves on the Capital Investment Committee, Economic Development, Development and Finance Policy, 
all these important committees and has been assigned to uh, to serve on the Great Commission and Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Uh, so very committed to improving uh, health, particularly among priority populations and, and communities of color. But there are a few things that that uh, they have championed in this last session that I think are really important to improving equity. And those are, I'll, I'll give the legislative number, but um, I'll give a short description of it. And I only, I'm only highlighting three. And one of them was House File 381 to increase teachers of color uh, in, in higher education. I, you know, I've got to talk to the Representative uh, Kozlowski even further about how do we do the same to uh, create a, a, a pipeline of, of, of public health folks from communities of color and American Indians, because I think that's an important piece as well to, to add to this, uh, this bill. Um, they have also been involved in um, uh, providing support and, and uh, creating uh, restrooms and locker rooms for a gender neutral, uh, label with gender neutral so that uh, folks in, in public schools can have access to that. Uh, and was very active in the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, or ECWA as it's called, and making sure that Native children uh, in the foster system are given priority uh, to be in a Native American home. But I wanted to finish up my introduction uh, by a quote from a citizen in Duluth who has worked with uh, Representative Kozlowski. Kozlowski. And that's uh, Jody Broadwell, who I have known for a very long time as well. Uh, and, and, and Jody sits on the Duluth by non-binary, queer, trans, two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, intersex, and sexual commission. And, and uh, Jody said that the youth in uh, Duluth really love Representative Kozlowski, and they see uh, Representative Kozlowski as a role model, and they trust uh, they trust Representative Kozlowski, and they feel like they they that, that they listen to them and are very supportive, and they call her Representative Lish instead of Kozlowski. So I think that's kind of neat. So we felt like they are very deserving of this work that is really rooted in trying to eliminate some of these. Uh, issues of, of violence and trying to improve racial and health equity. So I believe that Representative Kozlowski, okay, my apologies, uh, is present, so I turn it over to them. Ooh, um, <laughs> Bonjour, everybody. I, yeah, here's our first medicine, and that message from the youth really hit me in the heart. Um, I just wanted to open by sharing my Ojibwe name, Kozawa uh, Anakwa, Leish Kozlowski, Jagamashima, Leish is my English name, my my Ojibwe name is Yellow Cloud, and uh, as was mentioned, I'm really proud to be a Nijmani Dubug, which is a two-spirit, I'm a Megizi, Nindodam, a Megizi clan, and I, I use they, them pronouns, and um, I just want to greet you all um, as our relatives from Duluth. I uh, am up in Duluth. We call it Masabe Kong here, and uh, we know it as the the place of the giants. And you know, sitting here in my first term, having been elected as the vice chair of the Posse, uh, Minnesota Posse Caucus, the People of Color and Indigenous uh, Caucus, and to be here at your annual meeting with all of you uh, championing this work and also for the 120 years of outstanding, amazing uh, service that you've done to advance health equity and in our doing. And we see you in the communities and the Capitol, you know, every day working hard. Um, to my nominators, I mean, each and every single one of you are powerhouses in our communities. And uh, I, I just feel very deeply humbled that, you know, the reality of standing here on the shoulders of, of all the giants in, in the space and that had come before. I, I was looking at the list of um, recipients, you know, from Paul Wellstone to my partners in justice and Peggy Flanagan and Ruth Richardson um, and Lee Finke, who literally sits next to me in my office and at my desk. Um, you know, I 
when I stepped into this role reluctantly, very reluctantly, I was told to me and I wear my O'Day in because we're the people of the Heartway, um, that strawberry, that Heartberry, that this is a gift and it's a responsibility. Um, and so this award means a lot. Um, I think it's important for us to stop and take the pause and to celebrate um, and to remember that, you know, not nobody does this work alone. I, I could never do this by myself, nor would I want to, that we do this on the strawberry vines. And so in accepting this award, I know that I'm accepting this for the youth and for the elders and for the land and um, everybody who has got me to this point. Um, I was thinking a lot about Senator Robert B. Lewis's legacy. Um, it really struck me that I, I think he's a person that knew that health is wealth, but that also in our communities that we come from, that the measure of wealth is actually by how much you give away. And from one first of many to come as Minnesota's first black senator to being the first non-binary uh, representative, but also the only two-spirit representative in the country, that's a big responsibility. Um, and it really struck me some of the words that were said about Senator Lewis and accepting this award, um, that he really focused on people who didn't have a shot in life that um, didn't want to give him a shot and that he wanted to make life better for people. And I think it's that same rootedness and knowing that, you know, I, I didn't come here for a title. I came here for the purpose and the people um, in places and systems that, as you know, far too well are literally designed to, you know, crush us into pieces, but we don't come in pieces. We're, we're the sum of all of us. And so um, I think what I wanted to share with you today is that uh, I very much know my story is too many Minnesotans story. And, you know, from a kid from the streets of Lincoln Park, I always say, don't don't bet against uh, a cycle breaker as we're legacy makers. And I come from the big four. That would be my grandmother and aunties, three Native educators um, who are the uh, grandmas of Indian education. And my auntie, uh, who was the first Black woman to attend a nursing school in Minnesota. And they taught me that you know, everything we do is economic development, it's public health, it's climate justice, that our sovereignty and liberation are braided together. And so I think, you know, looking around these spaces that we talk often about statistics and facts and figures, but that, like me, I know that each of you are out there and you know that that's our aunties and our grandparents and our cousins and that, you know, the story on the opposite side of every bad tragedy, oppression, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, like violence, right? That, um, you know, we're people who laugh loud and love hard. And that's what it is that we're doing. And that's what this award um, is, you know, really inspiring me and um, going to recommit me to create that elbow room because we need each other in this work. And it's really big work. And from, you know, as I mentioned, protecting our black and brown babies to, restoring tribal homelands to raising minimum wage. Um, this year, we were able to do violence prevention for Indigenous, Black, and Latina people. You know, this is our legacy. And I think I, I wanted to leave you with that message too, that um, just as much as we need champions in elected office and to get into these spaces, and we need people who are coming here with heart rate leadership, who are grounded our people. You know, we need you. We need public health leaders. We need doctors and lawyers and entrepreneurs and social workers and people who are going to um, be unrelenting and never give up and showing up at the Capitol to say, show me the money, show me the resources, you know, invest in us and invest in our capacity. And so um, I'm just super humbled and blown away that um, you lifted up me and really my communities and all those people that um, I come from. And I'm really honored to be a partner uh, of justice in this work and in this life with each of you. And uh, Yes, please come to the Capitol. It's, it can be hard there in spaces, um, but also to do it with joy. And I think also some righteous anger and abundance. Um, and that's how we're going to go forward. So just really chimmy gwitch to all of you. Um, you know, Tony Morrison said, when, when we get these jobs that we've been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that our job is to look around and, you know, empower somebody else to free somebody else. Um, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. Uh, in honor of Senator Robert B. Lewis and in gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much. 
<clears throat> Our next award is the Harvey G. Rod, or I'm sorry, Dr. the Dr. Harold Hal LePink Scholarship. And this is an awarded to an early career professional working from local public health located in greater Minnesota. And I am going to hand this off to the nominator, Susan Fatuli. Thank you, everyone. Um, hi, uh, my name is Susan Vitulli, and I'm a Community Health Unit Supervisor at St. Louis County Public Health Division. And I have the pleasure of introducing Taylor Blakeman, who's receiving the Dr. Harold Hal um, LePink Scholarship. So I'm really honored to um, share a little bit of words about her. I think she really exemplifies the spirit of this award with her dedication and leadership in local public health in greater Minnesota. Um, Taylor has been working with the Carlton Cook uh, Lake St. Louis uh, Community Health Board um, here in the upper northeast region of Minnesota um, as the regional ship coordinator since January 2023. So she's my regional ship coordinator um, for the work that we do at St. Louis County. So right away in this role, she showed her leadership and collaboration, um, collaborative relational style um, by establishing connections with all the regional staff and partners to really get to know them and their work. Um, really coming into with that approach of just wanting to understand and find, um, you know, develop those relationships and look for those um, partnership opportunities. Um, and she's really embraced the um, structure of that and has really worked to um, enhance the vision of the ship work and really elevate the region um, and find unifying uh, work across the region to highlight um, the great efforts that are happening. So um, Taylor's really been focused a lot on um, leading the efforts to better communicate the work of SHIP and in the Northeast region and has really done a lot with the Healthy Northland newsletter. If you haven't signed up, please sign up for that um, to see all those updates. Um, the publication has really flourished under her guidance um, and being able to elevate that to a social media presence to be able to really tell those partnership stories um, and really looking for those opportunities to highlight the successes um, and continue to deepen the work. So she's been working um, through communication specialists on that, um, working with the regional community leadership team on that, um, and the local ship staff to really identify and tell the story of the why of the ship work um, and better articulate that through those day-to-day -day, uh, kind of communication efforts and newsletters and websites and Facebooks. And she's really um, is committed to um, elevating and supporting the work that's happening at the local level and um, really looking for those ways to tell the stories of success um, in the region, which I really appreciate. Um, so Taylor also really, one of the things that I really love about Taylor is her servant leadership approach and how she competently um, and confidently leads the local ship staff with an attitude of support. She really wants to see us all succeed and see the communities succeed um, and is really devoted to the health of the region. So, and you can really feel that in her interactions and the way that she embraces her role in this work. Um, she's also uh, really committed to public health and serves um, uh, at the state level, uh, working with MDH on advisory committees and bringing her innovative ideas and uh, rural perspectives to the statewide work, which I think is really valuable. And um, she also serves as the membership chair of the Minnesota Society for Public Health Education, where she works to support the growth of others in the field of public health and advance um, public health collaboration across the state. So I'm really grateful um, that Taylor is at the CHB and really uh, leading this ship work for us as a region. I think she's really an asset. She's a delight, um, has really brought some vigor and excitement to the ship work and is most definitely an emerging and future leader in public health. So. Thanks so much for the opportunity to nominate her and um, share a few words about her today. <laughs> you didn't know what to say to that. Um, I, <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I was like, I'm at a loss for words. I think, um, I think this is a really exciting time. Um, to do public health work. And I just feel really lucky that I get to wake up um, and work with really smart and dedicated professionals and students across the state. It's really what, what I love to do and why I get up in the morning. So um, I feel really honored. And also this was kind of an unexpected surprise to um, receive recognition, recognition from MPHA. Um, but even more, I just, I feel excited 
I think everything that I get to do is because I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of other people um, who have either employed or mentored me or worked with me. And I just really want to be able to give that back. So um, I, I think there's so many people who are doing hard things right now to make a difference. And um, I just, I really feel that and want to be a part of that. So um, thank you again to uh, MPHA and all of the work that your organization does. And thank you, Susan Vituli, uh, who nominated me. I think um, everything you said was just amazing and again, unexpected. So thank you so much. Thank you. The next award is the Harvey G. Rogers Environmental Health Leadership Award, which honors an individual through the years of dedication, distinguished service, and technical contributions has promoted the public's health through the preservation of the environment. And I am going to hand this to the nominator, Kathleen Norman. Hi, everyone. Um, I nominated Jessica to receive the Harvey G. Rogers Award. Jessica is very passionate about her work and I am going to try to stick to my <laughs> the things that I have written out here just to keep it within the time limit. Um, in order to promote public health through preservation of the environment, you have to know what you're dealing with. And um, Jessica is has been um, working upstream to determine what some of those problems are that we need to address in our environment. She's been the program director and epidemiologist for Minnesota's biomonitoring program since 2010, but her work and the impact of her work um, extends far beyond her current job position. As program director, she leads the epidemiology team implementing the Healthy Kids Minnesota program, statewide biomonitoring effort focused on measuring environmental chemical exposures in preschool aged children. Academically, Jessica has excelled at investigating a variety of chemicals in the environment and their effects on humans. Her many publications further the science around the potential exposures to, chem to chemicals, including metals, pesticides, phenols, phthalates, flame retardants, and markers of air pollution. Many scientists and epidemiologists would stop there. However, she has been instrumental in communicating ways for people to reduce or mitigate potentially harmful exposures in their community. Her work at MDH, um, in her work at MDH, she's built strong relationships with a wide variety of partners, including local public health, school districts, tribal nations, community organizations, and other agencies. It is in the relationship building that it takes time and patience and is, can be very time consuming, yet relationships are critical for building trust with, with communities. Jessica continues to be a trustworthy source of information in both her personal and professional life. It is those trusting relationships that have ultimately produced results that help protect vulnerable po populations in Minnesota communities where she works. Um, congratulations, Jessica, and thank you for the strides you've made in furthering knowledge around health impacts and environmental exposures and the work you've done with some of Minnesota's most vulnerable communities. And I'll hand it over to Jessica. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and thank you so much for this honor. Um, it really means a great deal, as everybody has been saying. I really appreciate the nomination from Kathy and the rec recognition from MPHA. Um, I, too, was looking at the list of um, former recipients of this prize, and I'm really humbled and amazed to be joining them. I know a lot of other people in this meeting, too, have been inspired over the years by the work of these current and former colleagues, just to mention a few um, Kristen Robb, Jim Kelly, Amira Adawe, Ginny Yingling, Helen Gaden, the list goes on. So thank you very much for adding me to this list. These people have really um, inspired me over my years in public service, just with their commitment, 
um, with working to improve environmental health in all Minnesota communities day in and day out, um, often without much recommend, um, recognition, but with so much dedication and heart. So I just want to be really clear to the to MPHA and the organizers how much these awards mean, as others have been saying too, it feels really amazing um, to, to know that our work is seen and appreciated. Um, so thank you. Um, and I was reflecting too, feeling like um, that I accept this award with renewed commitment um, to our team's work towards improving children's environmental health, towards reducing chemical exposures um, in our state, towards taking real actions to address the inequities that we see in these exposures. Um, Kathy mentioned, but if, if people haven't heard me talk about it, I'm really excited about our new statewide Healthy Kids Minnesota program. I'm really excited to expand the work we're doing on the important issue of high mercury exposures from skin lightening and other beauty products that, that contain very high levels of mercury. Um, and we use urine mercury testing specifically to help identify and then support folks who are having the exposures without any knowledge um, of that um, in reducing those exposures and move towards getting these products off shelves and out of people's homes. And I'm really excited for all the new projects and partnerships and important questions from communities and other partners that will come up in the future. So this is really reinvigorating for me. Um, I just wanted to thank all the families and people who are part of our biomonitoring projects. We do not take it for granted. We're actually asking parents on behalf of their kids and other peoples and communities to share with us some of their um, usually urine or a blood sample so we can test for these chemicals. No small thing. Um, I thank my colleagues at the Department of Health um, Sheila, Fati, Jesse, and many others, and I thank my family who all make this work possible. Um, and then just on a final personal note, I wanted to um, dedicate receiving this award to my dad, who passed away earlier this year, but who really put me on the path of um, public service and taught me how important it is for myself as well as for um, everybody else to work really hard, you know, as much as I can to try to make a difference in the world. So. Thank you again for the honor um, and for the inspiration going forward. Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you. Our next award is the Laura Waterman Whitstock Racial Justice and Health Equity Award and honors a person or team who has demonstrated their commitment to advancing racial justice and health equity for American Indian. African-American, Black, Latinx, Chicano, Latino, Latina, Asian-American, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, as well as individuals that are low income, LGBTQ+, immigrants, and those with disabilities. And to make this award, I will hand this off to uh, Jaime Martinez. Um, and this was nominated through a team, but I will, trans or I will hand it over to uh, you to make the award. Are you, can we help you on unmute if needed? Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for um, allowing me to make this presentation, especially to my, to the group that uh, was involved in nominating Chris Rhodes. Um, and I have a lot to say about Chris Rhodes, but I, I know I only have three minutes. Um, so, Currently, Chris is the director of the Office of American Indian Health at the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, but she, she has also been the, uh, she was also the founder and chief executive officer of Asemaki As Limited, a consulting firm that uh, works uh, with American Indian and Alaskan Native health issues. So um, Chris, um, was also the former executive director almost for a decade uh, of the American Indian Cancer Foundation. And in that role, she uh, focused on uh, raising awareness of the burden of cancer on American Indian and Alaska Native communities, working to build capacity, uh, supporting research evaluation to identify and develop uh, native led options. So um, she's a um, uh, and a member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, 
and a descendant of the Fond du Lac band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Uh, and a, she is really an outstanding individual who has great has decades of experience in strategic uh, issues, cooperative, and very uh, equity focused in, in public health. Uh, in her in her role and in her work, particularly with the American Indian and Alaska Native health concerns. Uh, she is really excellent in doing this work uh, in forming genuine alliances with academic institutions, governments, philanthropic sectors, and uh, support has supported inventive, long-lasting, and culturally-based projects. And I, I want to quickly tell a story of, of when I first met her, uh, when she was at the University of Minnesota, and she was um, so adamant about uh, she, working on tobacco issues. She was so adamant about trying to have the first uh, tobacco smoke-free powwow in Minnesota. And she she worked with the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa folks and their leadership there to try to do that. And believe it or not, she accomplished it. She, it was an amazing feat. Um, and from that point on, she became um, very handy at building relationships and, and working in, in, in the tobacco field. And was a was actually a research manager uh, at the University of Minnesota for the Tribal Tobacco Use Projects, which was innovative. Which was the first time it was ever. It, they ever created a comprehensive study on American Indian tobacco use to date. And even to this day, they are still the, the model for doing this kind of work. She she uh, ensured that the process was, was not only rigorous, but also met the needs of, a, of the academic community and, and the funding partners, but also made very sure that the data uh, was held by the nations and the the broader community uh, was only able to uh, have the uh, aggregated numbers, which is very, very important. I will say about Chris as well is that she's very committed to um, building capacity, particularly among uh, priority populations or what we call communities of color, American Indian nations. She was very pivotal in working with a clearway funded project called the Leadership and Advocacy Institute to advance Minnesota's parity for priority population. She was a, she was very good at uh, coaching uh, land fellows. She taught them uh, do some of this work and was a mentor to them as well as a trainer. So she just has done a lot of work that I've admired over the years uh, that, I, that I believe uh, has contributed to improving communities, not only in Indian country, but also in priority populations, which is why I felt, uh, we felt, it was so deserving of uh, Laura Waterman Whitstock Racial Justice and the Health Equity Award. So I'll turn it over to Chris to um, provide some more highlights, but uh, we really uh, heartily endorsed her for this award. Chris? Chief Miigwech, Jaime, I appreciate you. Buju Nindinoe Magani Duke, Chiakwe Indijnakas, Nagachi Wanang, Indun Jaba. I said hello, and I'm from, my my Indian name is Chiakwe, and I'm from the Fond du Lac Reservation. Um, when I got the email about this award, I just, I uh, seriously had a lot of tears. Um, Laura was my mentor and a friend. And so this award really means a lot to me and I'm just incredibly honored. Um, I wanna say thank you to MPHA for creating this award in her name. Um, thank you to Jaime, to Erica and all of those who nominated me for this award. I just you all mean so much and have been a part of um, my mentorship and support systems throughout the years. So in addition to all of Laura's other amazing accomplishments, 
Laura was one of the visionary leaders that stepped up to serve as one of the founding board of directors for the American Indian Cancer Foundation. And this is the board that trusted me to bring the vision to life as the first executive director of this national nonprofit. During the six years that I worked with her while she was on the board, I learned as much as I could from her. She was an amazingly strong woman who unapologetically led with her values. She used her voice to educate about Native people and equity with a strong commitment to the next generation. Um, Laura saw my potential um, and encouraged me to bravely use my voice in new ways. And so, um, I am passionate about racial justice and health equity. It's been where I've centered my entire career and about creating new opportunities that are grounded in that space where we bring our tribal teachings together with the very best available public health resources. That's how we continue to innovate um, and really address the public health challenges and health equity challenges that are in front of us. Um, uh, that's how we have to do it. Um, it's how it's tr how we are true to ourselves as Native people. I strive to lead with my values and my commitment to health equity for Native peoples, and I've been doing this for more than 30 some years. That smoke-free powwow down in Bayfront Park um, was uh, that Jaime mentioned. I had kind of forgot about it, but it um, is was a really important part of our journey. Um, I've done this work from just about every angle, but always with that same focus. And I'm here today um, with my strengths and challenges because of those who came before me. I know many generations have suffered to survive and thrive, and I respect their struggles and their incredible strengths. And the work I do is also for our future generations, our incredible children. Um, May they continue to survive and thrive in the opportunities and challenges ahead for our communities. So in my closing words of wisdom, I'm like, I don't know if anybody wants any, but I'm now what I consider what I've been told, I'm an elder in training. <laughs> and so I'm gonna say leaders make tough choices and there's rarely a time when anybody, when everyone is happy, but do your values work? Because once you have that in place and you're solid with who you are and how you want to be in this world, it makes being a leader so much more manageable for everyone. And not only for yourself, but people learn what to expect from you and everyone sleeps a little easier at night um, with those hard decisions. So Miu, Miigwech, Bizindawieg, thank you for listening to me today. And thank you so much for this beautiful award. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your words. Our next award is the Paul and Sheila Wellstone Public Health Achievement Award, which honors an individual who has distinguished themselves in public health through an outstanding contribution to promote and protect the health of individuals, families, and community, and leadership as demonstrated by the impact on others' careers or having made a co contribution that reflects innovation, creativity, or courageous pioneering effort consistent with professional excellence and public service. And to make this award, I'm going to hand this off to Dr. Jill Visker. Thank you very much and greetings everybody from what is normally beautiful Mankato, Minnesota, but you all have heard we got a little water down here. So um, yeah, best wishes and uh, keep those thoughts coming to those affected by the flood, please. So it is my honor to introduce Sheriff Sevchek. Um, as you all listen to the words of what this award is and who who this award should be given to, I, I listen to every single one of those words. And I think anybody who knows Shara would agree with me that every, you listen to all that and that just describes Shara and everything that she has done. 
So I've had the pleasure of knowing Sheriff for the past 11 years uh, when I moved back to the state of Minnesota and joined the faculty at MSU Mankato. Uh, we met shortly after that, and she is a graduate of our master's program, and she served in an adjunct uh, capacity for us for several years, uh, primarily with our Health 101 course. And she is currently the Executive Director and Community Health Administrator for Health and Human Services of Faribault and Martin Counties. Now, friends, there's absolutely no way I can summarize all of Cher's work and all the accomplishments that she has done since the time I've known her. There's no way I can do that in three minutes. But um, and, and again, hearing the words of this award and focusing on the part that uh, is giving back to the community. Now, I want to highlight some of the many things that she has done uh, with us in our university and really helping to shape the next generation of public health professionals and making sure that they are adequately trained and that they have a passion for the profession. So I'm sure you all have that one person in your profession that you can call upon when you need something, whether that is advice, access to something. It doesn't really matter what it is. Shara is truly my person. She may not be always excited to get an email or a phone call from me, but um, she's just always there. And she comes at, uh, at this and working with us and our students with a level of enthusiasm and passion that I can only dream of. And so I would like to highlight a couple of the main things that she has done with our university and with our students. And I'm very happy to talk about an ongoing project that has just recently started that will start to really take shape next year that I think really gives a testament to her passion for the profession and again, training that next generation of public health professionals. And so to highlight a couple of these things with her and her colleagues, many of whom are also MSU alum, um, Sharon and her team have done such things, work with our Health 360 course, which focuses on communication and advocacy and through their work, creating practical application assignments that can be given right back to communities that are usable, such as creating success stories, creating infographics, so on and so forth. Uh, Shara has served as a guest speaker in many of our courses. And for, you, we all were students at one point in time, and not all of us were excited to go to class. But when Shara is there, it's always a party, and I mean that in the most positive way possible that uh, when she's talking about any topic, I don't care what it is, it's whether it's just uh, stories from somebody who has boots on the ground, who is uh, practically implementing public health endeavors, to talking about day-to-day -day operations, to that and talking about data, quantitative data, qualitative data. She brings that excitement and enthusiasm that you just cannot help being a student in that class, just look at her and go, wow, I want to be her someday. And so the most boring topic in the world, she can take it and make it sound interesting. So we're always happy to have Shara in class to bring that practical perspective there. And so she's done other things through some grant funding initiatives. She's able to provide stipends for our students and faculty in the past who uh, attend Bridges out of poverty training back in 2023. And several of our students have served uh, under Shara in a um, in internship capacity. And having previously served as the internship coordinator, I got to listen to the stories from students coming back. And I, I, I wish I could just recall every single one of them because every single student who has worked under Shara has come back just with an excitement about working in public health. They're excited to tell me about every single thing they did. And I have yet to have a student who's had a bad experience working with Shara. But most recently, and I think what really uh, was the high point of uh, this nomination is the work that Cher will continue to do with our students. Throughout the past four semesters now, so it's been two years, uh, Shara and her colleague Liz Radell Freeman have been working with our Health 480 class, which uh, among other things deals with quantitative analysis, uh, needs assessment, program evaluation. And um, for a while, we had been doing these things, you know, so we would have, we'd have students help out and what have you. But um, instead of me coming up with fun projects, Shara said, hey, we have a great need for these things in public health. Why aren't we, Joe, why aren't we working together more on these initiatives to give the students a practical experience and to take some of the burden, to do some of the things that they would like to do, but possibly can't. And so um, uh, her and her colleagues in their area had conducted uh, some survey-based research on some COVID data 
And so we, uh, that data was given to our students over four semesters and they had a, I don't know if they had a great time, but we had fun uh, walking them through, analyzing that, looking at disparities so they could get a taste of quote unquote real world data. And at the end of the semester, they would then present their findings to local stakeholders. Well, because of that experience, Shara, and to keep this experience going, Shara was able to secure a grant uh, in excess of $500,000 to keep this initiative going that will be used to hire a liaison between uh, her organization and the university. And this will also include several other public health agencies to have our students work with public health professionals, not just on data and analysis, but on a variety of different topics. So we brought this to our friends in public health and said, what do you all need? What can our students work on? And this liaison will be there to have the students work on these projects that again, we don't always have the time and energy to do. And so because of Shara's passion about public health for many professional accomplishments, but in regards to the Paul and Sheila Wellstone Award for her work at MSU and our students, Cher, I can't think of another, any other person who is uh, more deserving of this award. So congratulations, and I'm gonna be quiet and pass it off to you now. Wow, uh, I don't even know how to follow that up. I'm glad that I wrote something because, uh, and, and Joe, I absolutely love every time you call me. So please don't ever think or ever stop calling me. Um, I just want to start, I guess, by thanking the Minnesota Public Health Association and my wonderful colleague, Joe Visker, for taking the time to make this nomination and for this award. Uh, to say that I'm speechless is an understatement. I was when I got the email and continue to be. I know Senator Wellstone was a tireless advocate for marginalized communities and one to always advocate for what is right, even if you're the last one standing in the room. As I looked at the list of past awardees, I was even more speechless. Um, so many of those past recipients were people I looked up to as inspiration in my own career, including Jan Malcolm and Michael Osterholm, who both carried me through public health during the COVID response. Uh, so to receive this award in the Wellstone's name is an incredible honor for me. I didn't start my college journey with the intent to go to public health. I think a lot of us go to college and end up somewhere that they didn't know they needed to be. Um, and when I took my first public health course, I immediately knew um, this was for me. This is what I love to do. Uh, and this is what I was going to do for the rest of my career. Um, I, so I feel so fortunate to have uh, found a career that I love every single day. Um, and I'm so excited for a career that allows me to use my strengths and for, as Joe said, to be excited about every day. Um, I'm also really excited about the future of public health, uh, working to innovate and modernize the discipline, finding new ways to collaborate between sectors and supporting student learning and rural public health agency capacity building. Public health has endured one of the hardest challenges in the past 100 years with COVID. Um, and it's at times it's felt like we were the last ones standing in the room fighting for what we knew was right. But together we all weathered that storm. And as a result, I think the future of public health in Minnesota is really bright. I'm so excited to be part of what's coming and uh, just wanna close by thanking the association and my amazing colleague, Joe, as I humbly accept this re recognition. Uh, this award means so much to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our final award of the afternoon is the MPHA Student Achievement Award, which is presented to a student enrolled in a master's degree program at a Minnesota School of Public Health or a student enrolled uh, in a master's degree program at Minnesota, uh, Minnesota School of Nursing with a concentration in public health. And to a student who's demonstrated leadership skills in contribution to the promotion of health of individuals, families, and the community. And I'm going to hand this off to Chris Hagen, uh, the nominator for this award and uh, presentation. Great, thank you so much. Hi, my name is Chris and I work in uh, the Minnesota Department of Health in the uh, state, uh, Office of Statewide Health Improvement, uh, working in both community well-being and workplace. And I have had many students uh, grace my door uh, as uh, AmeriCorps students or interns, uh, both undergraduate and graduate. And uh, have you ever met 
a person that you knew was just going places, just going places. And uh, Bill Suma is one of those young women who I am just excited to watch and see where she grows. Uh, Bill Suma uh, is a recent grad of Concordia University. Uh, she started as a nursing student and then the pandemic hit and she realized that there was a lot of misinformation going on in her community. Um, she is Ethiopian by birth and uh, Ormo community and WhatsApp were just blowing up and she was trying to talk to her family members about all the concerns she had over the misinformation. And then her parents got very sick with COVID. And she said that really was kind of a turning point to realize that public health is really the place where she would rather be. Her older sister is actually a graduate student in uh, the University of Minnesota program right now. So I think that probably had a little bit of uh, influence on her as well. Um, she um, received an award at Concordia University, finished up her degree while she was working in AmeriCorps, uh, working part-time jobs. Um, having some personal issues um, that were very difficult for her to work through, and yet, you know, came out on the other side um, absolutely um, in, a, in a fantastic way. We tried to give her a, as much um, information and, and ability to be able to see what goes on at the uh, Department of Health, and she decided that uh, epidemiology might just be her place. And so we're very excited about that. Um, she starts in the fall uh, as a graduate student, and uh, she is now currently working at the International Institute of Minnesota, has decided to do some more work in the public health field. She, her purpose is to improve the health and well-being of others. She is a guide to immigrant women and helping them with citizenship and the most difficult topic of FMG, uh, female um, uh, uh, mutilation, genital mutilation, and she is just um, such a compassionate person and has done just amazing things. I want to say that um, it's been really helpful to work with somebody who speaks several different languages, and as we've been talking about uh, difficult topics like uh, trauma-informed work, um, you know, I could ask um, her, you know, tell me about trauma and what is it, uh, how does it translate uh, in other languages? How about mental health? And has been really able to help me understand um, the importance of having more of a universal understanding of uh, everybody we live and work with. And I think Bill Suma's uh, ability to um, translate, to be able to uh, adapt to uh, a crazy number of situations that she does in her life, uh, both in work and, and at home, and her interest in even um, going back to Ethiopia to um, open up an orphanage. Um, I fully expect that I will probably be going to Ethiopia <laughs> And fundraising for this young woman because um, she's she's just that uh, kind of charismatic person. So, uh, so pay attention to this name in the future, and uh, I think she's going to do wonderful things in the field of public health. She's not able to be here today. I'm sorry, uh, and uh, she would be um, pleased and a little bit embarrassed possibly, and. Um, just know that um, she was also very grateful for being recognized. Thank you so much for sharing her story and her honor of this award. Well, we've reached the end of the presentation. Let's take one final time to acknowledge uh, our colleagues' work, leadership, and sharing their energy and gifts, whether through virtual applause or actual applause or Zoom and Zoom reaction in what we're doing. I can't tell you how many notes of inspiration I've taken down in this our short time together this afternoon, but really thank you so much for all of you and your time and efforts and our awardees. Um, I'd like to take just one moment as we think both at recognize our honorees for today, but also start thinking of who are those among you that you might think of as deserving public health leaders and look to nominations for next year. But overall, congratulations and thank you to our awardees for today. And I will hand this off from the Leadership Committee. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, thanks everyone for your participation, for the inspiration awards. It's so wonderful to hear 
about the impact that our association has around the state. Thank you. Um, this is our final slide. Uh, we're about to say goodbye. We're a little bit late and our apologies, but we couldn't interrupt such a good inspirational words. Um, there are some upcoming events for the members of the uh, Public Health Association. The Policy and Advocacy Committee are changing the date to do the 4th of July, and they did have a note saying that they will publish that on their website. July 9th, from 4.30 to 5.15, there will be an MPHA walk and talk for members, and it's going to be at the Theodore Worth Park in Minneapolis. Uh, meeting of the Health Equity Committee is going to be held on July 18th from 5.30 to 7.30, and that's virtual. Um, we ask that you save the date, August 15th. We will vote. A campaign of which MPHA is participating is going to be launched with the Secretary of the State at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and also virtual. Register at our events and um, please uh, consider becoming a member. It's a wonderful group. There is so much learning and so much opportunities to do things that impact our communities and our state community as a whole. Um, go to our website, there are some leadership positions and it's always a great opportunity. I am very honored to have served as your president and I'm very grateful for the help and support that I received. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Wish you a good rest of your day.